I've got to start where God starts, and that is with love. That's the transforming effect. Truth is the thing that opens the door to that love. And so we need to look at why we are so resistive to truth. It was funny uh, yesterday. I, I bought a juicer um, the other day, and this juicer isn't designed very well. And um, I bought it as, uh, I think it was, we, we have juice every day, so I bought this juicer. And uh, it's one of those low impact juicers, but it, it was the same model as the previous one that I'd had. And we needed a second one because we're now travelling back and forward between New South Wales and Queensland quite frequently. So I had one in one place and one in the other instead of carrying our whole kitchen down every time we go down. So, so we have one in one place and one in the other. So I thought I was buying the same thing. But unfortunately, they upgraded it. And you know what? With most upgrades, what tends to have happen is that they tend to improve, in quotation marks, the design. And when they improve the design, usually that means that the design is severely impacted negatively, which I found out to be the case in this juicer. So I email the truth to the person I bought it from. The truth is, this is what I said. <laughs> this juicer does, is not being designed properly. And I described how it hadn't been designed properly. And then I said what I felt like doing to the juicer. I said, I feel like getting out an axe and chopping up the juicer, which is exactly what I felt at the time. The main reason why I felt that was because um, the previous juicer only took me a half an hour to juice all of my uh, fruit. But this juicer, because of its design flaw, now takes me an hour and a half to do exactly the same job. And after a few times of doing that and trying to be patient, I gave up being patient because my real feeling was one of frustration. And so what I did, the next thing I did, was I modified the juicer a little, <laughs> which did actually help the juicer. It didn't break the juicer or anything like that. It did actually help it, but it still didn't cure the problem. So the time to do my juice went for, from an hour and a half to an hour and a quarter or so but it didn't fix the problem at all. So I felt the need to email it off. Now, I didn't expect anything. I said to the lady, I don't expect any warranty return because I've modified the juicer. I don't expect anything else. I'm just saying to you that you shouldn't be calling it a five-star juicer because it's got a design flaw. Now, what do you think the lady did with that? <laughs> well, the lady who was on the other end, and I won't say the company name, of the email has a personal emotional investment of her worth in this juicer. So she felt that I was attacking her personally. So what did she do? What do most of us do when we're getting attacked or we feel we're being attacked personally? We just attack right back. So the lady told me I was basically an idiot and I didn't know how to use the juicer and, and all of these other things she told me, right? Lovely customer service, I felt. <laughs> Which I emailed back to her and told her. <laughs> I just said, well, you know, that might be your customer service, but I assure you that if you continue to have this kind of customer service, that you're not going to have too many customers in the long term, right? Anyway, she emailed me back. It's because by this time she was enraged. Right? And she was, she was very, very sarcastic and, and, and bitter, and I won't go into all the words she, she stated. I was tempted to reply, but I thought, no, it's probably gone far enough already. <laughs> but what I'm getting to is that if this lady was emotionally open to the truth, she could have said, I am so sorry that your juicer doesn't seem to work properly. Have you tried this or that? Not assuming that I hadn't and not accusing me of not doing it. She would have said, have you tried this and that? And I could, to which I could have replied, no, I have not tried or I have tried those things. I had, I had tried those things. But she could have said, you know, we could have had some dialogue that wasn't, at all where she's now being angry and upset, right? No matter how angry and upset I might have been, right? 
she would have, we could have engaged this in a, in a much more loving way. But because of the resistance to basic truth and the emotional investment in maintaining a stagnant condition, we often engage a person in anger or wrath or fear. And that's what I'm saying, stating to you, is that this problem with truth is such that we often have an emotional investment in maintaining our facade. And because of this emotional investment we have in maintaining our facade, we are completely resistive to acceptance of any truth. And the unfortunate thing is, while we are resistive of the truth, no love can enter us. Now, I put to you that me emailing back this lady and telling her the design flaw of this particular machine, they could have improved the design of the machine and maybe even resulted in more sales than they currently have. But they have an entire website designed to extolling this particular machine, to highlighting the virtues of a machine that is basically flawed. Now, do you think in the long term they are going to have much success like that? See, potentially, every single person in Australia could buy one of these machines. It could be the best machine that you could ever think of getting if you were thinking of juicing. But now it's not. Now it's one of a number of failures because there was no acceptance of truth. And then on top of that, do you think I'm going to return to her company as a customer? No. In fact, I've bought two other manual juices that they actually had from a different company as a result of that interaction because of the lack of love in the interaction and the lack of desire to receive the truth. Yeah. And if we can consider that in our own lives, it would be very beneficial. Because if we can see that when we have so much of a wall up to truth, people just come up to that wall and look at the wall and go, wow, do I want to engage the truth with this person? Would you want to? So you withdraw. So if you think of it, for many of you, you see you've put up this resistive wall towards accepting truth. That's around the soul. Now, I'm not just talking about the truth that from somebody who you admire or honour. I'm talking about like your little child comes up and says, Mummy, why did you get nasty with that lady next door? there's some truth coming at you. Or when your husband or wife comes up to you and says, do you want to really know why I don't want to have sex with you? <laughs> do you really want to know that I, I actually don't feel like sleeping with you half the time? And do you want to know why? For most of us, what we do is we go, no, I don't want to know why. <laughs> Just sleep with me <laughs> and ignore all the truth. Right? And this is what we do, is we resist the truth, but unfortunately what we're doing is we're creating a rod for our own back. We're not allowing, because of this resistance to truth, we're not allowing the change that's possible in our own life as a result of, it, of actually having the truth enter us. So we're sitting behind our little brick wall and as truth comes to us, you know, if you're a person here on this side of the wall, let's say you're part, it's your partner, this guy's partner, and she's trying to share the truth with him. And he's got this wall up. Now, what would you do? Would you just keep bashing your head against the wall, going, I hope this works sometime in the future? Well, what would you generally do? What, what normally happens when people have got a wall up to truth like that? What do we do? We just throw up our hands in the air 
So it's all pointless. And usually we have a few expletives in between those two. It's all pointless, right? <laughs> and we just allow the whole thing to grud over because we feel nothing is going to change. And how do you feel when nothing's going to change? Don't you feel these feelings? Hopeless. Desireless. And so forth. Isn't that the emotions? And this is what the wall of resistance creates in our life. It creates this hopeless feeling. We're never going to be able to change. We're never going to, it's never going to get better. Our relationship's never going to be able to grow. And some of us will stay in that place because we're too afraid to do anything else. And we stay in that place all of our physical life and then, frankly, a lot of our spirit life, unfortunately. We stay in that same hopeless, desireless place. And that happens because of the resistance there is in this planet and in the individuals towards actually receiving the truth. Yes? And then Tara. Tara's there for somebody who's... Um, Joshua, I was just wondering, um, the wall of resistance, um, does it keep putting more resistance up the more you resist it, if that makes sense? Well, you see, one of the things we need to understand about resistance is resistance is born in fear. So every time we resist something, it's like building a brick wall with another brick. Every time we resist the same thing again, we put another brick on top of the wall towards that particular thing. So the resistance grows towards that. So The resistance continues to grow to until we're in so much pain that we decide to take the opposite action. Yeah. And in that um, growing of the resistance, does that also harm our bodies and our spiritual body as well? So we Certainly. just keep damaging ourselves every time we resist. Yes, our body truth, will begin yeah. to demonstrate the resistance. So, you know, when we're very young, we have very little resistance. So our bodies generally are quite healthy unless our parents have a lot of resistance. But then as we grow into our 20s and 30s, we start to get a few little aches and pains here and, and there and so forth. And then we get into our 40s and 50s and now we're starting to feel a lot more aches and pains. Our body's starting already to deteriorate now. We've got lines everywhere where we shouldn't have and, uh, and parts of our body everywhere that we shouldn't have. And, and this, is a, this is the resistance coming out now. It's demonstrating itself in our body. And so by the time we're 70 or 80, even our mind many times starts to close down now. We don't even want to know anything anymore, remember anything anymore, and so forth. So the resistance gets so heavy that the majority of people on the planet cannot live above 80 to 90 years of age. That's the result of the resistance. Now, scientists don't even understand why we can't live beyond that age. They see that they call it the what do they call it. There's a gene, they call it a gene. You ever heard of it? No, it's a longevity gene, the, it's, the, it's the gene associated with how long we live, right? And they call it the death gene. They don't know why even our body seems to want to die even though it's got the capacity to completely replicate itself every seven years they don't understand and i'm saying this is the reason why because our resistance to truth closes down every system associated with our soul it closes down our spirit body it closes down our physical body and eventually we end up in so much pain that we die our body cannot sustain its own life anymore because of the amount of resistance we've piled up now in our soul. Right? Now, the average person passes over then into the spirit world. Do you think anything's changed? Aside from a body, <laughs> nothing's changed. They still have that same level of resistance, so therefore they have the same pains in their spirit form, the same physical pains. Many of them believe themselves to be dying of a heart attack every day after they've died of a heart attack because of the resistance to the truth associated with that condition. Does that also like, become an addiction? Like, 
you know, the resistance to truth. Like, you just get so used to it, you just... Yeah. Well, I feel it's the resistance to feeling feelings of fear that have become an addiction. Yeah. Yep. Remember that this wall is constructed because of fear, and the only thing that destroys fear is... Truth. Truth. Yeah. Truth, this is what destroys fear. You see, and... We have to, before we will feel our fears, we need to actually hear the truth. Yeah? And this is a problem that we face, is that the false expectations that appear real to us or have higher importance to us than the actual truth has to us. And so what do we do? We resist the actual truth, wanting to maintain the false that appears real, the facade, the lies, that we've now maintained for most of our life and as a result of that we stack more bricks on the pile of resistance. So if we um, receive some truth and just straight away felt it and allowed it then we wouldn't have to work through all the walls of resistance that we put up it's or do you still have to work through all those walls of resistance? To, well the we walls of resistance are only there because of the fear. fear. Mm. So we have okay. to allow ourselves yeah. to feel our Fear. Fear. Yeah, so, so the only way for this wall to begin crumbling is for us to feel the fear rather than living in it. Live, 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 live in, in fear. Most of us live in fear rather than feeling the fear. We act in harmony with the fear. What the fear dictates is our life. We do everything the fear says. So if I feel unsafe, I want somebody to make me feel safe. If I feel unwanted, I want somebody to make me feel wanted. If I feel unheard, I want somebody to hear me. And I create a life around me where every one of my unfelt feelings creates my life because of my resistance to feeling the fear of those feelings. Yeah, I get it. And that's where the truth sets you free instantly. Instantly. The if truth you, has the ability to set if, you free. Yeah, it has instantly. the ability, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Certainly.